The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book One On the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness. Chapter 34 Pete's Castle. The boys stood as still as stones, but Lily stepped forward. She limped out onto the bridge and stopped in front of Pete. White hair wild, face smudged with dirt, he stood there unmoving, gazing at her. His eyes were deep and blue, and they shone like jewels. At once, Channer knew that somehow beneath the stench and beyond the strangeness, Pete, Pete the Sock Man was full of goodness. His eyes were so deep and so peaceful, Janner even began to believe that maybe Pete wasn't crazy at all. The rope bridge creaked in the silence as they stared at one another. Hello, Mr. Pete, Lily said after a moment. I'd love to come to your castle again. She reached out to his face and he stood frozen, a skittish animal about to spring. Did something happen to your lip? It's swollen. Pete shook his head slowly, staring blankly at her. Janner cleared his throat. Pete blinked and looked up with surprise. Yes, well then, uh, hello. Uh, follow me, petite. <laughs> he whirled around and strode away, leaving the Igbies no choice but to follow in stunned silence. After six more creaking bridges, they saw the treehouse where Poto had found Lily four days earlier. It was cradled in the boughs of the largest tree they had yet seen towering twenty feet higher than the bridge that led them to it. The structure looked to have been made from the old lumber of fallen houses that littered the meadows near Glipwood. The planks were of mismatched grains and shapes, but arranged and nailed together neatly. Green-leafed branches cast quiet shadows on the sides of the little building, and, it, and made it look to Janner as sturdy and welcoming as the only inn. There were even windows in Pete's tree castle. The last bridge led to a thick, winding limb that was worn for much traffic and had no rope railing. Pete ambled across the limb without a thought, but it was too precarious for Lily to cross with her crutch. Pete turned and noticed this, gasping. He bounded back, swept up Lily, and carried her across in one fluid motion. Neither Tink nor Janner received such service, but they crossed without trouble. Another rope ladder on the other side of the trunk led up to a trap door in the floor of the treehouse through which Pete was already helping Lily. The boys scrambled up and into Pete's castle in the trees. Pete was humming as he tore the diggle carcass into pieces and dropped them into a pot. Lily made herself at home and sat cross-legged on the floor against the wall. Come in, young men, come in. Diggle cooking. Rumple eating, diggle, diggle, rough food, he said in a sing-song voice. Tink and Janner climbed into the treehouse and sat next to Lily, who wore a very satisfied expression on her face. She looked up at Pete and gestured to her brothers. Mr. Pete, these are my brothers. Janner and Tink, Tanner and Jink, Jinker and Tan, Janker and Tink, Pete said without looking up from the pot. But how did you know our names? Jenner asked. Small town boys, crazy people hear lots of things, Wiggaby, Pete said. It's Igby, Tink said. Pete shrugged and lit a small bundle of sticks and moss that sat in a crude fireplace beneath the pot. The fireplace was lined with stones, and above it he had fashioned a chimney of sorts from some kind of hide sewn together to make a tube. Janner was impressed by Pete's ingenuity. That is, until the treehouse filled with smoke. Pete didn't seem to notice. Tink coughed. Mr. Uh, Pete the Sock Man, sir, aren't you worried that your house will catch fire? Pete fished a leather pouch from a small box beside him and sprinkled some of its contents into the pot. A delicious smell rose from the pot and mingled with the smoke. Worried? Not at all, young Wiggaby. He pointed through the nearest window, and the children could see three nearby trees whose branches were charred and leafless in places. I've burned down my castle three times before, and I've always survived. I'm not worried a whit, worried a bit. He went back to stirring the pot. Well, this time I think I figured out the problem, see, problem, see, problem, see. He sang with a wink. Rocks! See these rocks? 
They don't catch fire. Nope. He coughed and for the first time noticed the smoke filling the room. Eep! He cried. Pete tugged on a piece of twine that dangled from the chimney tube and the smoke slowly cleared. Open the flue, open the flue, open the flue for me and you. Janner began to rethink his opinion of Pete. He was as crazy as a moonbird. Pete turned from his pot to face the children. He sized the three of them up, particularly the boys. His lips were moving, and he was absently scratching his flurry of hair with one socked hand. The pot began to steam, and Tink's stomach rumbled. Pete looked at him, and a flash of pain came over his face. Hungry, are you, Tink? He murmured. Of course you are. Janna could see the stack of leather-bound books Lily had mentioned, beside an old trunk against the opposite wall. Something about them tink tickled at the back of his mind. So... Do we call you Pete? Jenner asked, fishing for more answers to this mounting question. Is that your real name? The sock man stirred the boiling pot with a long wooden spoon and didn't answer. The Igby stared at him in an awkward silence. What's a real name? Pete said finally. He pointed the spoon at Jenner. Is Jenner Igby your real name? Yes, sir. Is it? Pete said, turning back to his cooking. Tink could think of nothing but food. After several minutes of watching Pete fuss over the stew, he cleared his throat. Is that almost finished, sir? Pete raised the spoon to his lips and tasted the broth. He nodded, then produced four wooden bowls from a crate and ladled the stew into them, smacking his lips. They ate in a silence punctuated only by Tink's and Pete's occasional grunts of pleasure. Janner was surprised to find that snapping Dickle was delicious. Now, little dingle figs. Igby's, Tink corrected again through a mouthful of meat. Iggy feathers, whatever. He grew serious and sat up straight. I thank you for your kindness and your visitation. His face darkened. However, I must ask that you never, never, ever come here again. His voice cracked, and he sank to the floor. You cannot visit me. I terrible smell. I smell terrible. Your sweet birds could be eaten by a dapping sniggle, a snapping diggle, flapping viggle, igbees, or toothy cow. Oh, the horror. And I might be dangerous. I might hurt you. Might hurt you without meaning to, you see. I... Pete stopped short and cocked his head to one side, listening. He shrieked and leapt to his feet, but his head smashed into the low ceiling. Unsteady from the blow, he staggered, a sock hand lifted to his head. Something outside, he breathed and collapsed in a heap. The children stared with shock at the figure on the floor, all lanky limbs and white hair. Then they heard a whine from below them. Nugget, Lily cried, and she scrambled over to the trap door. Nugget was looking up at her from the foot of the tree, wagging his tail. He found us, Lily said, then panicked. A creature of the wood could have gobbled him up. We have to get him up here, she insisted. With a careful scan of the forest below, Janner climbed down the ladder and managed to carry up the little dog under one arm. Pete was still unconscious, but didn't look hurt. In fact, he appeared to be taking a happy afternoon nap. Just let him sleep. Tink said. He wanted us to leave anyway. Tink slurped up the last of his bowl. Snapping diggle stew, he declared. Who could have guessed it would be this good? Footnote 1. During the second epoch, Tom Billy, chief of Band Rona in the Green Hollows, fell ill to a malady for which the, med the medicines of the Hollows could find no cure. Their chief was wasting away and could eat no food, though his wife cooked for him a new meal daily. The wise men searched the land over for a meal that might cure his sickness. When old Ma Vorba, the seed catcher, suggested stewing a snapping diggle, she was ridiculed for a foolish, but she cooked the diggle with greenions and potatoes and served it to Chief Tom Billy when his wife was away. The chief's health returned. For years, the diggle was believed to have healing powers, until it was discovered that the chief's poor wife was the most dreadful cook Erwiar had ever known and Tom Billy was starving himself rather than eat another bite of her food. 
To this day, a traveler eating a fine minute meal in the green hollows might still be might still hear someone exclaim, Ma Vorba, that was tasty. Janner crept past Pete to the pile of books in the corner. I don't know if that's such a good idea, Lily said. Janner shushed her. I just want to have a look. He crawled over to the pile and slipped out one volume. He opened it, and Tink and Lily saw him gasp and look at Pete with wonder. Pete stirred. Quickly, Janner slid the book back into place and scooted back to where he had been sitting. Tink and Lily questioned Janner with their eyes, but he shook his head, then cleared his throat and said loudly, We should go. The sock man groaned and sat up, rubbing his head. Bye, Mr. Pete. Janner was extra polite. Thanks for the food. Was that? Was that? Food? Pete's eyes widened. Something's out there! He shrieked. He leapt to his feet and crashed into the ceiling again. Ouch! He staggered about with a socked hand on his head. It's all right, Mr. Pete, Lily soothed. That was just my dog, Nugget. Remember little Nugget? Lily scratched the dog's chin. Remember little Rugget, he said, wincing and looking at the dog with confusion. We have to go, Janner said. Yes, you do, said Pete, plopping back down. And don't come back. I'm so sad to say it, but don't come back. He touched his swollen lip. You mustn't come back, his head drooped. Goodbye, Wiggaby Ig Feathers. Pete carried Lily across the high limb and placed her gently on the bridge while the boys followed. After they crossed the second bridge, Janner turned to wave goodbye. Pete was back in his castle, watching them from the window. Janner couldn't be sure, but it looked like Pete was crying. Janner didn't speak the whole way back. Several times, Tink asked him what he'd seen in the book, but Janner didn't answer. The Igby children wound their long way over the bridges until the trees began to thin out again. The only sound was Nugget whimpering as the little dog scrambled across the bridges, more afraid of falling than of a whole gobble of toothy cows. Janner marveled as Tink tried to reassure Nugget that heights were nothing to fear. Halfway back, Janner and Tink heard familiar, chilling howls that made them and Lily freeze in their tracks. Several dark shapes emerged from the tangle of brush below them. From their perch on the tree bridge, the Igbys watched silently as a pack of horned hounds passed through the trees below like a gray fog. When the hounds had gone, the leaves on the forest floor directly beneath the bridge rustled, and the ground bulged like a pot of boiling cheesy chowder. Out from its burrow popped a warty, brown dig toad as big as a goat. Footnote 2 the bumpy dig toad has been known to attack humans, though never yet fatally. Victims of a dig toad attack complain of the squishy, fluchy feeling of having a sticky tongue violently flapping upon them. Since the bumpy dig toad has no teeth, its bites are said to feel, feel to the victim like being gummed like a dumpling in an old man's mouth. At the same time, to Lily's horror and her brother's fascination, an oblivious fazzle dove lighted on the ground not far away, pecking at worms in the dirt. Without warning, the dig toad's tongue shot out and scotched the bird into its mouth, leaving a cloud of gray feathers floating in the air where the bird had been. Lily squeaked and covered her mouth. The dig toad turned up its black, bulbous eyes and regarded the children for a long, terrible moment. Finally, it let out a blatting croak and half walked, half hopped away. Just as the sound of the dig toad's departure faded, a smaller creature with black matted hair skittered into the area. A rat badger, Janner whispered to Tink and Lily. The rat badger twitched, it, twitched its large, pointy ears and sniffed around the forest floor until it found the dig toad's hidden burrow, where it slunk inside without a sound. A moment later, the large rodent appeared with a yellowish egg held carefully in its mouth. Footnote 3. The rat badger is dangerous not just because of its long claws or jagged teeth or because of its feisty disposition. The rat badger's greatest weapon is its eggish flatulence. 
With what Janner could only assume was an angry croak, the dig toad returned, its tongue darting out as it pursued the fleeing rat badger. In seconds, the forest was quiet again. Janner marveled at the way the forest could hide things. It seemed so innocent and harmless, even beautiful, while beneath its surface prowled such ruthless, deadly creatures. Why was so much in Janner's world not what it seemed? His thoughts about his mother, about Oscar, then about Pete the Sock Man. They all had secrets. It was a journal, Janner said, breaking the silence. And? Tink said. Janner looked at Tink and Lily. On the front was a picture. Janner looked intently at Tink. A picture that we've seen before. What was it? A dragon with wings. Tink's eyes widened. The same as the Anorean journal? The one we found at Oscars? Janner nodded. And there were lots of them in the treehouse. At least twenty. How would Pete have gotten his hands on Anorean journals? Maybe they're his, Lily said. I don't think so. The first page said, This is the journal of Artham P. Wingfeather, throne warden of Anorea. Tink frowned. Tink frowned. What's a throne warden? I don't really know, Janner shrugged. I haven't read much about Anorea or its history. Oscar doesn't have many books on the subject. Sounds important, Tink said, looking east through the dark foliage of the forest. Anorea, Janna repeated the name to himself. The world, the word felt good on his lips, like laughter or a pretty song. Standing in the middle of the swaying bridge, he suddenly was lost in thoughts of faraway green lands, of dragons with wings, and of their mysterious sock-handed new friend. Neither Tink nor Lily said anything, but Janner knew they were thinking of Anorea, too. Their thoughts were interrupted by the clicking chatter of a cave blat lumbering across the forest floor below them. Without another word, the Igbys made their way back to the edge of the forest. Janner paused to be sure no toothy cow, cave blat, quill deagle, horned hound, or other manner of beast was prowling, then scooped up Nugget to carry him down the rope ladder. At the bottom, he set the grateful dog on the forest floor and waited for Lily. Tink came last, with Lily's crutch under his arm. With one last look at the swaying bridge high above them, they made for town as fast as they could. But back in Glipwood, breathless, Janner was struck with some sense that something was wrong. The streets were empty. A hot wind blew and licked up dust and leaves. Where Commander Norm usually lazed on the front steps of the jail, there was now an empty rocker creaking ominously in the wind. Janner turned northeast, and his stomach knotted and dread seeped into his bones. A plume of angry smoke billowed from the trees in the direction of the Igby Cottage.